Leadership in the church is crucial, it's critical, it's vital. Godly leadership is absolutely critical to the success of any church anywhere in the world at any time. Think about <clears throat> the story of Paul's first missionary journey. Um, Saul and Barnabas set out and they begin to do ministry and they plant churches in Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Derby, Lystra. And then they sort of retrace their steps. And we read this in Acts chapter 14 and verse 23. It says this, And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. See, God has a plan for his church. And that is that godly leaders lead in a godly fashion. Under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ, and informed by his word, a group of godly men who have met very specific qualifications together seek the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church and for his people. Those qualifications are seen in 1 Timothy and, and Titus 1 and, and other places. But the reality is this, that when leaders lead badly, when leaders fail to lead, when leaders lead unethically, churches suffer, people suffer. It's almost always the case, almost always the case that when churches go through bad experiences, deep water, struggles, conflicts, and splits, the reason can almost always be traced back to poor leadership. Because godly leaders are, are empowered by God to defend the truth against error, to nurture unity in the body, to disciple the flock and discipline them when necessary, and to set direction for the church. And this is absolutely critical for any church to succeed. But it's also critical for any home to succeed. It's critical for any marriage to succeed. It's critical Leadership is critical for any business, any army, any human institution that is going to be successful in its mission must be led well. Now, obviously, the immediate application for this passage of Scripture is the church, leadership within the body of Christ. But there are principles that I'm going to talk about that I believe are transferable to your business and to your child raising and to your marriage and to your community group. And I think it's important that we try, although we need to keep the focus on the church, try by implication to apply these principles to our lives more generally. Excuse me. When Epaphroditus got to Rome, he had told Paul about the conditions that were brewing in the church in Philippi. He told them clearly that there was an issue between two very prominent women in the church and they were not getting along and this was causing strife and it was causing significant disunity in the church. He also told them that there were false teachers who were denying certain fundamental theological principles that Paul had taught the Philippian church and others were coming in, other leaders were coming in and saying, no, no, Paul didn't get it right. This is the truth. And so since Paul is in prison, he can't return to Philippi, what does he do? He sends two men, two trusted men. He sends two leaders to the church. Now, they clearly had elders. But what he does is he sends, he identifies, and then he says, I'm sending you two leaders to deal with the situation that you are facing, godly leaders. So after writing the letter, Paul entrusts the letter to Epaphroditus, and Epaphroditus returns to, Philipp to, to Philippi, and this is what, from verse 19 of chapter 2, Paul says, and I'd ask you to take your Bibles and follow along with me. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 19, and Paul says this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. 
For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. For I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself also will come. I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my needs. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Father... I pray that as we turn our attention to this passage of Scripture, that you would open our minds, open our hearts to receive it. I pray, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Change us through this interaction with your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in these verses, Paul identifies four valuable leadership principles I think there's probably others, but I just didn't have enough time to to deal with all of them. But I think there are four principles, major principles, that I want to pull out of this passage of Scripture. Principles that, again, are transferable to, I believe, every leadership role in which we find ourselves as men and women. Leading the church, leading a family, leading a ministry, leading a business. And I want to say something really quickly before I begin. While the role of leadership in the church, the role of pastors and elders, that is reserved for men, I'm convinced, I know it's true, that God gives women the role of leader. You ladies have been gifted, many of you, with the role of leadership, the gift of leadership. And while God doesn't allow, his word is pretty clear on this, women to serve as elders and and have uh, a role teaching the scriptures in in a setting like this, Women are gifted by God to lead. And if God has gifted you and called you ladies to lead, I would encourage you to do so. So what does godly leadership look like? And again, I'm not speaking about the characteristics, those qualities that we find in in 1 Timothy 3 or Titus or in other passages of Scripture that mark and delineate and define what an elder should be like in terms of his character. I'm talking about leadership qualifications Ways of leadership. And these four characteristics describe, in my mind, at least the beginning of what godly leadership looks like. So, four things. Godly leadership, first of all, or godly leaders, first of all, anticipate the best of those that they lead. And I want you to look very carefully at verse 19 again. And think about what Paul is saying. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. So Paul's plan, I'll send Epaphroditus with the letter, and in the letter I'm going to tell the Philippian church that it's my plan to send Timothy. Remember, Timothy was known to the church. He had been part of the group that planted the church initially. This is 10 years later, and they they are very familiar with Timothy. And what Paul says is, I'm going to send Timothy to you. He's going to appraise the situation, and he's going to get back to me. And I'm quite confident, and this is the important part, I'm quite confident that the news that I hear from you will be good news. I'm quite confident that the news that I hear will be news that cheers me, that encourages me that causes me to rejoice in what God is continuing to do in your lives. Now, this tells us a lot about the kind of leader that Paul was. He expresses a confidence in both Timothy and in the people of the church. 
despite the issues that are facing the church, despite the challenges that the church is having, despite the threat of disunity, despite the threat of a certain apathy that's beginning to creep into the church, and despite the fact that people are denying and, and contradicting the theology and the doctrine that Paul has taught, his confidence in Timothy, Epaphroditus, and the people of that church causes him to say that when I finally get a letter from Timothy, I have every hope that the news will cheer me. And here's the point. Paul believed in the people he led. Paul's default position was to assume the best of the people that he led. It was to expect that Timothy would lead well and that the believers would do the right thing and behave as Christ would have them. Now, Paul wasn't naive. He wasn't foolish. He didn't see the world through rose-colored glasses. He knew about the church in Galatia. He knew about the church in Corinth. He was totally familiar with how bad and carnal and sinful and evil Christians can be. But in this instance, his default position was to expect the best of those he was leading. He trusted them. That little phrase, I think, gives us a glimpse into the character of the apostle, into his soul. When warranted, Paul's default position was always to trust, to have high expectations of those that he led. High expectations communicate trust. High expectations communicate competence. I believe in you. I believe that you can do this. High expectations communicate an idea or, or sort of the concept that, you know what, I have trained you, Timothy. I have nurtured you. I have taught you. Now it's time for you to go and do this because I believe in you. And it inspired those who follow. I learned this principle very early in my ministry life. I think most of us are wired to be cynical. Most of us are not wired this way to expect the best of people. I think we are wired to anticipate and expect the worst of people. As a pastor, when I learned this lesson, we would have a discussion about a situation. And I said, guys, let's always anticipate that this person, this situation, these people are going to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing. And it was always fun when, we came, to time, when it came time to put together the budget. I said, guys, let's anticipate that the people of our church are going to tithe and give sacrificially to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's anticipate that they are going to be obedient with their resources. Now what does the budget look like? Because when leaders do the opposite, it is absolutely discouraging, debilitating, demoralizing to those people who follow. Because it says, I don't trust you. It says, I don't believe in you. It says, I don't think you can do this. I don't think you have this in you. So, very simply, again, when warranted, when warranted, as leaders, in the church particularly, but in other facets of life, other contexts, it's important that we expect the best of those that we lead. Now, why could Paul do this? Why was Paul able to do this? Why did he have that sense of unshakable optimism? Well, he has already told us, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul was confident. Paul was hopeful. He was confident. He was boldly optimistic that God, having begun a work in them, would perfect it. That God, having started to transform and change and grow and nurture and shape their lives, would continue that process in his absence when he's not there watching over their shoulder. You see, he was confident in the Holy Spirit and in the working of the Holy Spirit that what had begun would continue. And I think fundamentally, good leaders approach their children, their employees, the people of their church with that approach, particularly if they are Christians or if you're in a Christian family. Again, when warranted, I keep saying that. Paul 
Paul really believed that God was working in the lives of the Philippians. He really honestly believed that God, despite the obstacles, despite the temptations, despite the struggles that the church may be having, he believed that the Spirit of God was working in that church. And he believed that when he heard back from Epaphroditus and Timothy, that the news would cheer him, be good news. He trusted God's people. So whether you're raising kids or running a business or leading a church, anticipate the best of those that you lead. One of the things that pastors do to get themselves in trouble is they forget that they're pastors and they think that they're bakers. And they want to have their finger in every single pie of the church. And it just doesn't work. They micromanage. They spend so much time managing people, they don't spend a lot of time studying the word, which is what they're called to do. An effective leader in the church is a a leader who trains, who nurtures, and then anticipates, expects, and believes because of the working of the Holy Spirit that the person he or she is trained will be able to do the job and gets the finger out of that pie. It's a small point, but I think it's an important point. Secondly, godly leaders always come third. Look at verse 20. For I have no one like him, now this is where Paul is speaking about Timothy, who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. So Paul begins to speak about Timothy. He begins to affirm him. And he says a couple of things. Timothy will be genuinely concerned with your welfare. And he will be genuinely concerned with the interests of Jesus. He'll be concerned with what's important to Christ, and he will be concerned with your welfare, Philippians. So Paul identifies Timothy as a man who comes third. Christ's interests first, the church's interests second, and his own personal interests last. And then Paul says something I think we got to see. For he says, for they all seek their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. Who are they all? Well, we'll talk more about this next week and probably give more definition to who they are. But the point I want you to see right now is that clearly in the early church, there were people in ministry serving their own interests. There were people in ministry who were coming first. They were serving their self-interests. They were using the ministry for their own benefit, for themselves. They were seeking their own interests. And so we can say conclusively that at least since 62 AD, the church has been plagued with people who come first in their minds. Plagued with people who have chosen not to be third after Christ's interests the church's interests, but put their own interests ahead of Christ in the church. Now, you just need to read a little bit of church history to learn about simony. Simony was the, the, and it happened all over the the church, particularly in medieval times, when a, a son in a particular family would be bought a living, bought a parish or bought a diocese, And he could be a pagan guy, sinful guy. But he would be given this role in a church by which he could feather his nest. The bigger the parish, the bigger the salary. The bigger the diocese, the bigger the status, the more money that you would make. And and, and for a lot of time in the history of the church, up until about the Reformation, and even even after in some places, people would go into the ministry for self-interest, financial benefit. Now, today, that's generally not, when you think about, I want to make a lot of money, you generally don't think about becoming a pastor. And I'll speak from personal experience. If you want to get rich, don't become a pastor. But there's still a lot of people today who go into ministry because of self-interest. They don't know much about coming third after Christ's interests and the interests of the church. Let me explain. For many leaders, the ministry can become a source 
an illegitimate source of self-glorification and self-aggrandizement. When a young man goes into ministry or feels the call to ministry, and that young man has never really discovered their security, their worth, their identity, their value in the finished work and in the person of Jesus Christ, it's easy for them to begin to look at the ministry as a means of security, worth, and significance. A kind of leader often unconsciously at first uses their position for personal glory, uses their position to burnish their self-esteem and self-worth. And you can see it because they need to be noticed. They need to be valued. They don't like being contradicted or criticized. They long to be thanked and acknowledged and esteemed. And here's the point. When a leader finds his value, identity, and significance in the position they hold rather than in the one who is holding them, the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not long before this horrible switch happens. And that switch is this, that the ministry begins serving the minister rather than the minister serving the ministry. The ministry becomes a means of self-glorification. The ministry becomes the means by which this man, this leader, this worship leader, this person finds affirmation and worth and significance and value. And so suddenly, the ministry, the pulpit, the position, the title, the role becomes an idol an illegitimate idol used to meet a very legitimate need that all of us have, a need that only Jesus can ultimately meet. When we do what we do in ministry or in any other leadership capacity to be noticed, thanked, praised, or admired, we can never, ever have Jesus' interests first, or the interests of others first, because we're placing ourselves first. That's why in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says this, whether you eat or drink, or whatever mundane thing you are doing, whatever else you do, even down to the most mundane, eating and drinking, do it all to the glory of God. Do it all to the glory of God. So whether you're leading children to Jesus, whether you're leading a million-dollar corporation, whether you are leading sick patients to health, whether you're leading your family, whether you're leading a church, whether you're standing in a pulpit preaching a sermon and leading a congregation, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And if you do, then something happens. Something happens that is absolutely wonderful. If you do it to the glory of God, then you begin to love his people. And suddenly you find yourself third. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it for him. And I'm doing it for them. And I'm privileged to have the opportunity to do it. You see, in order to truly come third as a leader, you've got to become passionate about the glory of God. And I told you last week about that dumb little prayer I prayed, because this is something I've struggled with all my life in ministry. To not be a glory robber. To not take from him what he rightly deserves and accrue it to myself. Every, every leader struggles with this, and if they don't, don't follow them. Every leader struggles with this. And the only antidote is that dumb little prayer that I told you about a couple of weeks ago. I prayed it again this morning on the way here and during the worship. Lord, glorify yourself through this sermon. Whether I come across as a success or a failure, because that doesn't matter. 
Glorify yourself. And when we get that right, when we get that right, self-interest in our leadership just sort of begins to disappear. Because if we're worried about his glory and his honor and his praise and his name, suddenly we become worried about his people and concerned about how they're doing and their blessing and their benefit. And the same is true in your family, same is true in your business, same is true in every facet of your life where you have leadership responsibilities. When we make God's glory our passion, these things fall into place and we quickly find the joy of being third. And that is Jesus and others and you. Remember that? J-O-Y. Simple little thing. But if you want to know joy in your life, learn to come third. And we learn to come third by making Jesus number one in his glory. Thirdly, embrace humility. Embrace humility. Godly leaders embrace humility. In these next few verses, we have examples of the Apostle Paul, in the Apostle Paul and in Timothy, of profound and beautiful humility. Let me read that for you again from verses 22 and following. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son or a child is actually the word with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord shortly that I myself will come also. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my needs. Stop there. So first, Paul talks about Timothy. Timothy's proven worth. Paul's expressing the fact that Timothy is competent. And then he says, how like a son or a child, he has served with me in the gospel. So we know from history, in the history of the New Testament, that Paul picked up Timothy and circumcised him and took him along in the first missionary journey, that journey that we talked about a little while ago. And so for many years, Paul had served with Paul. Or, sorry, Timothy had served with Paul. He had served Paul. Together they had been like um, an, a, a, a tradesman and an apprentice. And that's the picture that Paul is drawing on here. How a father, he might be a stonemason, he might be a tent maker, but he's doing his work and his son begins to mature and the father begins to show the son how to cut the goat skins and how to sew them together and the son grows up in his skill and in his ability and he begins to emulate the father and, and suddenly he is a master craftsman like his father, trained by his father. So for years, Paul had served under Tim, uh, Timothy had served under Paul in the gospel. He had learned to preach and he had learned to lead. And now for the first time, for the first time, Paul is commissioning Timothy to go out on his own. He's already sent Epaphras, but he says, I'm going to send Timothy, and he is going to lead. Now, this is the first time in about probably 12 to 15 years that Timothy has been given this responsibility now to go and lead. For that whole time before, he has humbly served he has quietly and humbly learned from Paul. So faithful, humble service has preceded leadership in the life of Timothy. And that's so critical. That is so critical. Over the years... At my old church, we used to, sometimes we would hire, oftentimes we would hire people from within the congregation, I think the way that you did with me here, um, which is a brilliant thing to do. We did that many, many times in our church. And there were obviously other times we hired people from Bible colleges and, and different places. I remember one night, we had a marriage seminar. We brought some people in to talk about marriage. It was a weekend. And we took the, all the chairs, most of all the chairs out of the sanctuary. And it's a room about this big. And we brought in round tables, and we turned the entire sanctuary into a dining room. We were having date night. 
And the guys would bring their wives, and we would set the table. And there's roses, and there was candles, and there was, you know, the lights were dim, and soft music was playing, and we had a little talk about marriage and stuff, and, and everybody had a beautiful meal, and, and, and then it was over. And I got to preach the next day, and it's about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And I'm running around taking tables down and wheeling tables, and, and there was 650 chairs like this that had to be kind of linked back together and put all in the line so everything looked good for the next day. And I look up at the sound booth, and there are two young staff guys up there just talking, just chatting away. About it. And I'm out there sweating, and all the old guys like me are out rolling tables and carrying chairs and like my bad hip. And, and, I, and I went over to those guys and said, guys, what are you doing? Oh, we're just, uh, we're just talking about the evening and stuff that we learned, and you know. And I'm going it'd be really great if you could come and help us because there's a lot of work to be done. Oh, yeah, no problem, no problem. So afterwards, I, next day, or the no, next day would be Sunday, and then Monday I was in a coma because I was exhausted. So Tuesday, <laughs> Tuesday I called him into my office, and I said, guys, I want to talk to you about what happened the other night. And I said, here's a principle I think is critical for you guys to understand, particularly as young leaders, and it's this. If service is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. If, if service is beneath you, and just in the most mundane things, like rolling tables and setting chairs back up, and carrying food down on the elevator, down into the kitchen, if that's beneath you, then leadership ultimately is way beyond you, way beyond you. And to their credit, they responded really positively. But we see that in Timothy. 12, 15 years, he's been serving. He's been apprentice. He's been learning humbly. And now Paul's sending him. Now Paul is saying, I got no one like him. He will be concerned with your welfare. Everyone else is concerned about their own interests. He is concerned about the interests of Christ. And then something else fascinating happens here. We see something about Paul's humility in verse 25. He says, I want to send Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was a young man that was saved in the Philippian church. He eventually became the bishop, the first bishop of Philippi. He says, I'm going to send him back. He brought the money and stuff that you ministered to me. I'm so grateful. I'm sending him back. And look at how he describes him. Look how he describes him. He describes him as an equal, a brother, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier, someone who has ministered to me, someone who has been an enormous blessing to me, someone whose life has enriched my life. Humble leaders... Therefore, promote others to lead. Godly leadership is to recognize competence, is to recognize godliness, is to recognize giftedness, and then get out of the way. Get out of the way. Let the next generation lead. Now, that's not easy. As an old guy. And when I, when I left my church, I didn't, I didn't get fired. The elders didn't want me to leave. I was happy to stay. But I knew that it was time. I knew that it was the right thing. I don't know how. I just think the Spirit of God was just telling me, it's time. This, this church needs to be transitioned to younger leadership, to younger men. And so stepping back was hard because I'm not a humble man. So what do we got going on here? What's happening? We have two young men humbly serving an older man. And the older man promoting these younger men who have shown competence and faithfulness to positions of leadership. And I am convinced that that's God's plan for his church. My mom came from a denomination, a fellowship of churches where elders got appointed for life. And you think I'm old? <laughs> you should have seen some of these guys. And what would happen regularly is that men 
who very nobly aspire to the office of elder. 1 Timothy 3.1. It's a noble thing to do that. Because of their passion to lead, would leave. Just simply go to other churches to have that opportunity to serve the church of Christ as an elder. It was a sad thing to see. More often and more regularly, the bigger problem is that when young men who are unwilling to live in that place of humility, to be the apprentice, to learn at the feet of an older man, become leaders prematurely, very often they're just simply not ready. And one of the blessings of this strategy, I think, is that it rids the church of insecure, weak, self-promoting men who long for a position to glory in rather than humbly seeking to advance the interests of Christ. The humility of Timothy and Epaphroditus is obvious. They were men of sterling character. They met the qualifications that Paul had talked about. But they were men of sterling character who found their security, their worth, their value, their identity, their center in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And therefore, Paul knew that if he even entrusted them to ministry, they would serve Christ and his people and not themselves in ministry. Godly leaders have to be humble enough to advance the next generation. And the next generation must humbly serve until God advances them. I think it's a, I think it's a critical principle of church governance. And then lastly, I want to read from, for you from verses 26 through 30 about Epaphroditus and his maintaining of a singular focus. For he, Epaphroditus, has been longing for you all with, and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. And did he, indeed he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, i.e., Timothy and Epaphroditus. For... He, Epaphroditus, nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. He almost died, risking his life for the ministry. So we have a leader in Epaphroditus who risked his life serving Christ. He almost died serving Christ. And he did it because he had a singular focus. He had a singular focus. And I think that Epaphroditus would have said with the Apostle Paul that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the kind of man that Paul is talking about. This fellow soldier, this brother, this partner in ministry who risked his life and almost died because to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that was his focus. So the question is, how do leaders get and maintain that focus? How do we get to that place in our journey so that tomorrow morning we get out of bed and go to do whatever it is that God has called us to, and we're able to say, for me today is Christ, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. How do we get to that place in our journey? Because I know that if you are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you sang that last song about Christ's death and his resurrection on our behalf, if when that verse was read at the beginning of the service about how God loved this world and gave his only begotten son so that if we believe in him, we not, might not perish but have everlasting life, if that, that verse resonated in your souls and elicited an emotion of thanksgiving, and if that's who you are, how do you get to that place where you say, tomorrow... To live is Christ, and I'm going to die to everything else. 
I think the only answer, the only answer is the cross. Jesus said it so succinctly and so powerfully. He says, Who does, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. They understood, Epaphroditus, Timothy, Paul, the people of the early church understood that the cross, picking up the cross, was a call to come and die. Die to self and die to my agenda and die to my priorities and die to my dreams and die to my vision and die to my bucket list and die to everything other than what Christ has called me to do for the honor and the glory of God. They knew the call. And the only way that we get there is to focus on the cross. A singular focus on the cross of Christ. And that's why the Lord Jesus has instituted this service of celebration and communion and remembrance. And the church is to do it regularly. We're so easily distracted by the baubles of this world. And therefore, it's critical that we come to times like this in the life of our church and our focus is drawn back to the cross, to the broken body of Jesus, to the shed blood of Christ, to the reality of what he has done for us. How do I find the impetus to trust people, to find the best in people, to look for the best in them? How do I find the courage to strive to be third in my home behind my wife and my kids and my husband and my children? How, how, do I, how do I do that? How do I find the strength to be that self-effacing leader who elevates and affirms and encourages and advances others and not himself? Where does that come from? Where does the, culture, the counter-cultural life that we are called to live come from? It comes from the cross. But not only just the cross as an abstract theological reality, but the cross celebrated in communion, a celebration where Jesus is present, where he says, I'm here for you. I'm here if you're proud. I can give you humility. I'm here if you are struggling to be third. You know what? I'm here if you've never really found your center, your self-worth, your identity, your security in me. If you're still looking to the house you live in, the car you drive to identify your job, your title, come. Come and remember and come and feed, and come and receive, come and be transformed. Calvin used to say, and I say this all the time, that the Lord Jesus is never more present with his people than during the communion service, during the Lord's Supper. So I want to say, Jesus is here for us in our neediness, our insecurity, our pride, our selfishness, he says, come, come, and I'll meet you in your need. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we aspire to lead well. We aspire to follow you as leaders in areas that the world would consider important and significant, and also in those areas that you see as as important and significant in our homes, our marriages, leading our children. But Lord, we need you. Oh Lord, we need you. And I pray that in these next moments that you would manifest your powerful presence in this place as we remember what you did for us and as we remember that you are here for us. Meet us in our need, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.